Good afternoon, uh, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, I'm Luigi Ricciardiello. I'm uh, the chair of the UG Research Committee, and, and I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this very interactive, very interesting session uh, uh, within the My UG Community Program Hall. Uh, and the session is entitled Marinating or What's to Come, the Future of Research. And uh, we wanted to have this session as inter as interactive as we could have. So um, the speakers are not going to show any slide. It's gonna be an open discussion. And we would like uh, uh, the audience to interact with us. So please use you know, the, um, the pad to send you know, questions to the, uh, to the uh, speakers so th that we can address you know, the issues that we are going to talk about. Um, so, uh, as I said, we have three esteemed speakers, uh, uh, Tamara Matisiak from Nantes, uh, Silvio Danese from Milan, and Dirk Haller, who is uh, the, uh, just received uh, the uh, research prize from UEG from Munich. And, uh, and so the, I think it's going to be important uh, uh, to have them introducing themselves to start with. And then I will pose uh, uh, some questions and I'd like to, uh, again, to have the audience uh, as interactive as, as possible. So Tamara, can you tell us a little bit more of yourself? Thank you, Luigi, and really thank you for inviting me to this uh, session. I am very happy to be here um, and happy to share with you some uh, some of my, uh, some of the things I did. Uh, so I am gastroenterologist, uh, I'm clinician, so my daily life is to take care of patients, cancer patients. During my career, I traveled and I actually different countries. I started in Poland, my country of origin. I moved to Finland, then I came to France. And meantime, uh, with some experience also in, in Japan, in the United States, all the time when I traveled, I also traveled through different um, topics of research. I started with Helicobacter pylori, the study of epithelial barrier. I moved to celiac disease and now for several years now, my research has been focused on gastric cancer, carcinogenesis, uh, with uh, more clinical uh, studies on gastric precancerous lesions, evolution, non-invasive mar markers, and from more fundamental research on microenvironment in gastric cancer, and specifically two components, enteric nervous system, and more recently, immune response. Uh, so this is what I did. I did everything to combine through all my career, clinics and research, because I believe that it's the best combination for the physician. Thank you, Tamara. Silvio, Silvio Danese is in uh, Sarafelli Institute in Milan. Tell us about yourself. Hello to everybody. Uh, uh, you know, Luigi, I like the story of, uh, yeah, there was a Twitter that research is more a lifestyle than a job, which is the case. In fact, I'm, uh, I, I'm uh, eating bites now while we are speaking because today it has been a really crazy day of work and in between with UEG. And uh, basically, I've done always uh, IBD translation research. Actually, I always say that uh, my career has been uh, with all the different parts, uh, like being in a restaurant. If you want to run a good restaurant, you learn to do to be a waiter, to help in the kitchen, wash to, the dishes. Wa exactly, wash the dishes, and then you start managing it, and then maybe you can be the owner and not looking at it. Uh, so I started with a postdoc in which I've done basically completely basic science. And in the lab where I was, I was completely uh, learning everything from being a technician to being a postdoc and so on. And then of course, being uh, uh, with IBD, the translational part is very uh, easy, let's say, because you really combine research and patient care, which is uh, possible with on, off and so on. And then after that, I've been always interested in uh, multiple cell types, including a translation of with animal work, a little bit of uh, cancer, because uh, you know the situation in Italy, it's always funding related to cancer, which is easier. In Italy, IBD does not exist as a funding source, basically, uh, unless some lucky moment of the last 15 years. 
and then uh, and one of the major aim has been always to have the help of the growing of the young talent we can discuss later about yes. this because this is key so Dirk Dirk Haller is from uh, Munich tell us about yourself yes uh, hello to everybody out there um, pleasure to be to be with you again um, well I think my CV is a prototypical example of what you can achieve if you just want. Yeah, um, you know when I when I started uh, at university, I started actually with food sciences. I'm, I I I was uh, in, in food microbiology, found that interesting, but it didn't really grasp me. Then I started in parallel to study nutrition science with all the biochemistry and things like that. And again, the combination um, at the end made it and. Um, in those days, I still remember when I gave my first university lecture on mucosal immunology. And in those days, that was 1995, nobody in nutrition science ever thought about immunology. And um, you know, there was no chair in, in Germany on, on nutrition and immunology. And to some extent, I would guess um, I, I was lucky. Yes, we are all lucky because we are at the right time at the right spot, but I think also, we kind of passionately worked for it. Yeah. And in those days, um, I decided um, to, to do postdoc scenarios in, in different labs. One at the Nestle Research Center in Lausanne, um, realizing that if you want to understand probiotics, you need to understand the microbiome. And then I moved to Balfour Sartre's lab in US. And, and from there, became independent grants to build my own lab um, than in Munich. So I think um, passion is one description of my scientific life and a certain, I don't know from where, um, vision where I want to be. Um, and at the end, now we're looking at microbial signatures and how they affect the gut mucosal immune system, especially the barrier um, cells, epithelial cells. And on the other side of the coin, I'm still passion about metabolism and integrate this at the moment into yeah, danger signaling and, and how metabolism could be an innate um, way to recognize the environment. I think that's the, that's the broader vision. So uh, we said um, that we are going to have fun, Dirk and Tamara. Let's make a democratic vote. Let's do that for every question that we have asked. <laughs> at the end, also Luigi will answer on his part. So Luigi, now it's your turn. <laughs> so my, actually, my, my turn uh, is very simple. I, uh, I started with uh, asking a thesis uh, to graduate in GI, and my professor actually told me he should... Uh, uh, there is one project on H. pylori, there is another project on H. pylori, there is a project on treatment of H. pylori. This was many years back. And then there is another project on uh, uh, 13C UBT for H. pylori diagnosis. And then he said, well, I would like to have someone starting to work on the genetics of cortical cancer. And that was uh, actually how I picked up, uh, you know, uh, my topic. And then, of course, I did my postdoc in uh, at UC San Diego, then I came back in Bologna. I started my, you know, my own uh, uh, research group. Then I moved back to the United States, uh, where I stayed almost five years. Uh, continued to do research on coronal cancer, and now I'm back in Bologna, uh, working on on chemo prevent, mostly on prevention of coronal cancer, uh, trying to modulate, you know, signals and and not just in uh, hereditary GI cancer syndromes, but also in sporadic cortical cancer. I also uh, coordinate uh, the uh, uh, colon cancer screen program at the university hospital. So I'm uh, uh, combining, you know, uh, translational uh, and clinical research together. But uh, the, the bottom line, what is actually, uh, um, you know, um, very obvious is that you have to have passion, you have to have curiosity, and you have to have perseverance because uh, uh, that has to move really um, your, your, your work into research. But we also want to know a bit more about our audience. And so I will ask a question to the audience. 
Um, are you undergraduate or PhD student? Are you postdoc researcher, established scientist? Let's see what they are, uh, who they are, and and then we will start, you know, asking other questions to the uh, to the panelists. I think that while uh, uh, people are voting, one minute, there is a rule that the chair sings a song. No, that I can't sing. Not, sorry. That was my understanding. <laughs> so now you should start. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, a joke is fine as well, but it needs to be funny, Luigi. Okay. Well, you know, he's the incoming, he's the incoming chair of the research committee, so he's asking the wrong person. Okay. He's all I the tell you, I tell you, I tell you the joke. <laughs> I can, I can, I'm, think, I'm thinking to twist it in a German lab and an Italian lab. <laughs> so, an Italian lab, why you're not so productive? Well, you know, one day the ice is uh, finished, another day the, the technician is on strike and so on, and that's the difference with Germany. I'm just joking. I think nowadays it's individual uh, productivity and passion that leads the, the success of each one. Absolutely. Actually, we can discuss this. My return yeah. back to yeah. from the States to Italy, like a cold shower. We can discuss well, it. It's always a cold shower. Exactly. You know, you know I don't know whether we may you have some time now for discuss it, but I remember one of the very famous scientists in France. He got a very prestigious <laughs> instant prize a couple of years ago. And I remember he was interviewed. Oh, sorry. I will tell you later. So the... Um, uh, as you can see, uh, you know, it's evenly split. Uh, and so um, Sibio was actually introducing uh, uh, one Im important sentence that, which is actually is basing our, uh, our session. Um, so research is a lifestyle uh, more than a job. And this was uh, coming from a TED talk that uh, uh, inspired this session. And the researcher was, uh, actually referring to the uh, sacrifice of countless hours, the, uh, uh, you know, working on weekend. We all know that uh, our brain still works at night, uh, thinking about, you know, data and uh, how to write the papers and how to approach future research. So uh, my question goes first with, uh, to Dirk and then Tamara and Silvio. Do you agree with this sentence? Uh, um, what can be done in, in terms of improving the uh, work balance uh, of researchers, especially for um, you know, clinicians who are uh, you know, trying to combine clinical work, uh, research, and teaching? Well, I think you know, for me, at least, passion was one of the most driving um, motivations uh, in, in this job. And I think it protects you. <laughs> Um, from all what you what you said, because if you're passionate about things, then you don't look on your watch to go somewhere else. Um, you can you can compensate um, um, if if your research uh, goes to the desert, yeah, um, and and that will happen. Um, there, there are going to be slim times. So I think passion is a driver. Passion is a protector. Now the question is. Does everybody need to be passionate? Yeah, I, I, I think that's what we would love to see. In reality, when I look into my lab, I think the young people, they come with a slightly more differentiated um, picture of their life um, in, into this equation. And, and I think we have to accommodate to some extent to this um, and, and um, basically talk with them about what, what, what would their achievements um, or how should they look like and where, where would they see themselves in, in a couple of years. And um, I have this, for example, and that's something, especially in my lab, um, a lot of women um, are around, nutrition science is dominated by women. And, um, you know, to keep them in science um, is, is one of the biggest problems. Um, if I look at my university, we are, I think at the moment, 30% faculty. Um, women and, and there are already 10 years of efforts behind it. And when I look at this, it's an everyday kind of 
juggling um, building bridges to, to keep them in, in this job because there are, there are plenty of uh, hurdles they have to jump over. Um, and passion again helps. Um, so I, I would say in, in, in the modern lifestyle, um, passion is important, but we, which probably go into this with a lot of passion, need to be aware that, uh, that the folks around us are probably also very successful with a little less passion, little, a little bit more of work-life balance. And uh, we also have to adapt to this, I think. Tamara. Yes, so actually I, I, I just started to tell you something <clears throat> and then I interrupted, but actually I can tell you now because this is really linked I remember it was a couple of years ago, I, 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 I saw an interview of one of really very famous researchers in Curie Institute who discovered some important molecule. And they asked him, what is the key and what is the secret of the success in research? It is a little bit related also to the style of life. And he said something that I was not sure at the beginning that I, uh, that I, was, that I agreed. And I must say that uh, I read more and more every year with him. And he said, the key thing to have a success in research is to work with a group of good friends. It looks strange to me at the beginning, but now I see that research is to spend a lot of time, a lot of time with a group of people who are interested by the same topic, you work together, and I think this is extremely important to have a proper environment and the people with whom you understand each other and you are just, you, you have fun together in a way. So, so I think it is definitely research. It's, uh, again, you mentioned, it's a little bit more difficult for the women, I, I, I agree. Uh, because of course there are some that's, that's normal. We have some, some other things and, uh, and uh, it may be a little bit disturbing. But uh, again, the crucial point in research, I think, is to create a very uh, good environment that the people feel good inside. And then we can build projects. Not necessarily only because they are genius, but because we have different ideas and we like spending time together. And this is the project work. This is something I am the more and more convinced about. You know, the first thing uh, I always like to say to every person, uh, the word research. Before talking lifestyle and job, I always say, you know what means to do research? Means search and search and search again, redo multiple times until you get the answer to the question that you want. And I think that uh, patience is the first characteristics together with passion, because without that, you cannot uh, really work on this. And then the lifestyle, I mean, everybody, particularly if you think about being an MD and also uh, a scientist and looking at patients and trying to do research, it's always very complicated. I don't know, Luigi, if you are going to dive into some of these topics for the colleagues that are clinician and would like to do research, but you know, you basically do two jobs at the same time. And it's the tough. 24 tough. hours are those 24 hours. So it means a lot of uh, personal. You have to take calls and, uh, you know, um, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. And, uh, and again, it goes with passion, perseverance, uh, and, and, you know, um, and that is really motivating. Uh, I'd like to ask the audience also to uh, pose questions. Uh, and while waiting for, I have another one uh, to our panelists. Uh, um, so you are all leading, uh, you know, a group of researchers. Uh, and uh, what is your vision uh, to, you know, enable the discoveries and success by your researchers, PhDs and postdocs? So um, how can you enable this? What, are, what is something that would be important for the young researchers working in your lab? Who wants to go first? Sorry, Luigi, my connection got crapped for a second. Can you say it again? So what is your vision to enable, you know, ah, yes. through this course? Uh, yes, yeah, so what I understood. So, uh, you know, I always, uh, you know, the first thing that I did for, okay, for the very young, 
uh, this is um, this is very important to keep them motivating and explaining. So let's talk about the Italian system and not the Italian system of today in 2020, but uh, 15 years ago, in which there is this hierarchical system for which the professor has to be the lead and so on and blah, 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 which I hate. So from the start, when I was uh, uh, very, very young, I start just not caring about this. And uh, to the student, a medical student that was doing his thesis, he got first a name in Gastro, and I was just a resident, and I got last name in Gastro. I got a lot of complaints. I didn't care. But this was the motivation for which myself and this uh, poor medical student have spent so much time in the days, in the nights, in the weekends to do our, our first, let's say, Italian gastro paper, because publishing in gastro from Italy is very complicated. And, uh, and that uh, is the motivation. And I think that this is also a very good signal for all the young people uh, in the environment, because I mean, uh, having the possibility, you know, the, the youngs are the ones that are more motivated, are the more talented, the ones that have more time to study. So the best students are the ones that teach the, let's say, the, the supervisor, because they know so much more than you can do, because you have not so, so more time sometimes because of family, because of life in general. So I think that this is very important. But also, I think, uh, you know, having them presenting their data at, uh, you know, conferences and, and, you know, showing and getting already feedback make en enable, you know, the young researchers uh, to interact with their peers and making sure that they can grow within, uh, you know, uh, the community. And, and you're right. I think, you know, that is that has always been something that we have seen from uh, the other side of the ocean more than our side. I remember... Uh, when I was in San Diego, um, uh, John Carreders, who was working with uh, my, my, my chief, Rick Boland, he had a 17-year-old uh, high school student who did like a month of working with him, and she presented the abstract at the AGA. And I was like, <laughs> I was completely, in, not in shock, but I was positively, you know, um, impressed because you need to give... Uh, um, those who are really coming with the ideas, fresh ideas, and uh, are younger, you know, the perspective that they can really uh, show their breakthrough um, findings. What do you think, Dirk? Well, I think what I try to do, at least in the lab, is to create uh, an environment for curiosity. And um, usually the first half year, I, I try to give them maximum freedom to just to explore things, to get familiar with the system, with technologies, which is sometimes challenging, but also to try stuff. And, um, you know, I, I, I love, I encourage people um, um, to do stuff I have not approved, uh, to say, you know, they, they should just do stuff. And uh, whatever they do, it's, it's yeah. fantastic. And, uh, you know, it's, I think, it lies in the nature that we are chronic enthusiasts. And uh, this is sometimes a bit overwhelming for the young. Um, so I, I, I try to give them niches um, where they can explore their own, their own ideas. And, um, you know, and then, and then you already see those who take that chance and those who may not and need further guidance. And then, then, you, can, then you can step in and, and do it. But, uh, I think creating this niche for the unexpected is mm -hmm. something, at least for me, important. What about you, Tamara? Yes, so I, I must say that I like uh, coming from the patients. Uh, most of my fellows are either young physicians or medical students. I must say that I like somehow discussing with them, let's, okay, let's do a visit together. You ask question, why is it so? Why why this, why this patient is this and this doesn't, etc. I say, well, that's an interesting question. How could you approach this question? What should you do in translational research or something you should examine? So I think coming from the patients is a good uh, starting point, I think. And about the discoveries, because this is something, you know, we would like all made big, made big discoveries. I think it's a dream of all of all, you know, everybody. Uh, this is a different thing. Uh, I, uh, you know, as you look at different big discoveries in the past, 
Uh, actually, I mean, even these recent discoveries, you look discoveries of H. pylori, you know, how was it, Luigi, because you, was, you were so at the beginning also in H. pylori field. It was by chance. If you look to penicillin discovery and other, it was by chance, but the chance come to those who try, who do something, who are active and who do. So I say, maybe not the, oh, well, now I'm going to discover a big thing today. No, you are just going, doing, you are curious, you are patient, you, you do, and then discovery comes to those who try. Good, then we have still a chance for a Nobel Prize, talking of which today it was awarded, you have seen it. I'm yeah, just joking. You have seen an Italian. An Italian but you know, you know I tell you the today. story, it's funny because when I was in the lab, the first week I started studying basic science. At that time, being an MD, I didn't have at all the culture of studying those very difficult papers of basic science in immunology. I could not even complete them. So I was more in the concepts rather than in the science. And then in the, after one week, I start saying, oh, maybe I found what is the cause of IBD. And then... <laughs> so you get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> exactly. But then I realized that it was all fantasy. So. But you need to have that type of mindset. You know, you need to have the enthusiasm. You need to have the curiosity, as Dirk was saying. You need to let people exploring things that are, outside of the box or you know far away from your your way of thinking because then you can by discussing you know you have um, from from different ideas you get one that is excellent and that is going to be a breakthrough in my opinion yeah. well maybe maybe I can add a little comment here um, you know when when I look at, at at least my career I always had a, a, a some sort of vision where I wanted to go and I think uh, no idea how, how to get there or how to achieve this, but this was kind of the motor. And uh, if you look at the different talents in your lab, they're, they're very different. And, uh, you know, it's also a crucial thing to find out what, what drives the people. Do they, do they really have a certain vision for themselves in, in their way they look at the scientific questions, but also how they want to implement this in, in their lives? And, uh, and then to, to foster and uh, to, to give them the chance to explore things. I think that's, a, um, that's probably more our duty nowadays in our level of the career than, than anything else. Yeah? So that's the, that should be one of the driving forces for what we do. But the success, it's really because of the, of the colleagues that are uh, the, in the, of the team. I always say that it's like a boat. And the victory or any success is really because of the teamwork. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, we can proceed actually with the um, uh, word cloud number one. And while we uh, proceed with that, I ask you the same question that I'm asking uh, um, the audience. So as a researcher, what are your main challenges today? We are not talking about COVID, so uh, we will touch about COVID later on. Um, what do you think are your uh, main challenges today? And then uh, we will have, you know, the results from the, the, the uh, uh, word cloud. And I'd like to start with uh, Tamara. What do you think are your main well, challenges? <clears throat> again, today? and you say in one word, because there are several, several. But my feeling, just, you know, at first glance, I would say time. Mm -hmm. Given the occupation we have, the patient, the, the, the other university, hospital, administration, etc. So I would say in our, uh, in our context, in my context, I would say time. What about you, Dirk? <laughs> exactly the same. Um, and I think the, the more experienced um, people around would probably all say the same. And, you know, the funny, the funny thing is when I have discussions with um, um, older colleagues, um, is this going to go any better? Um, am I growing wiser in making decisions where to go and not to do and what, you know, to, to trim down the activities? And then they all say at the end of the day, no, um, probably this is what we have to juggle. Um, we, have, we have duties, meanwhile, which take a, a burden on our, you know, 
time account. Um, and um, um, and it's more about the decisions we take. Where, where is the focus? What, what is it we leave out? Um, and what is it we're gonna do? And I'm, I'm still not wise enough, I have to say, um, that I can give a clear answer to that. I'm still driven by curiosity. And since I'm curious about many things, I'm, I'm running into different, into different scenarios and realizing, yeah, it's the time. So my solution this year, for example, was to, to do a sabbatical and to be half a year out of, out of the context. I, and that was fantastic. I wrote, um, for example, the UEG research proposal. I, I wrote an ERC grant. I focused solely on, 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 the, on the research topics and that refreshed my mind. Um, and you should see the difference in my, in my calendar um, before um, September and after September. It's absolutely crazy. You came not happy that you did a sabbatical and you didn't ask to come to Milan, eh? Oh, Because it would no. have been a real plus to have you around. <laughs> but Silvio, I, I can tell you, I can do this every three and a half years. And, okay, so uh, I start to book I myself to, to have you in the lab, eh? Yeah, so absolutely. have you already have you already made your list of places where you want to do uh, your sabbatical for the next few years? Uh, every three and a half years you can do that. So then you can uh, you can find your know, nice places. Uh, so Silvio, what about you? What do you think are the main challenges? You know what is the the truth is that for me the big challenge are two big challenge. I know that you say now one word, but first okay. is to find people colleagues that have truly the fire of research, which honestly, out of uh, 30 people that go to the lab, through the lab, maybe you have only one, and that's it. I'm very sorry to say that, but and uh, generally, the big labs attract a lot of talented people, but this is uh, what I see. And second, that science is becoming so much technology that the expenses are becoming huge, and the environment is not sustaining. I don't know, probably you are touching later on about funding or something like this, but uh, the, the sustainability of research is becoming crazy. And this is a major issue. I, I cannot agree more with you. Uh, so these are actually the, um, you know, the words work-life balance, time, balance, funding. Um, so to go back to uh, Sibyl's comments, I think to the first comment, I think this is exactly what I'm, uh, we are experiencing as well. Uh, um, it looks like, especially for MDs uh, doing research, especially translational research is not very attractive. They are very much interested in uh, uh, learning how to do endoscopy and then, uh, you know, just go uh, and work uh, um, in a clinic or um, in a, you know, even a private hospital outside, uh, you know, their academic institution where they trained. Um, what I try to tell, uh, you know, my, uh, especially my, my younger fellows is uh, that you have an opportunity to establish yourself as a leader. You have to think about the other way. So if you start if you have your own idea, you want to bring this idea uh, to the, you know, the field that you are interested with, then you can become really someone who uh, to look for. And, uh, and that is going to be really the future of your life. Um, but again, I think um, they don't see a lot uh, right now. They don't see this as an opportunity. And uh, it's really a dismal because uh, Silvio uh, approached, you know, translational research and he was very candid in saying that the first paper that he read on IBD, uh, he could not complete that. The same for myself when I started to read about uh, KRAS mutation uh, in colorectal cancer. Uh, but I think we need to be, um, we need to talk to our fellows. We need to provide a different view of a different perspective on how they can build a career. And then of course they can do still, you know, uh, clinical, uh, clinical work. They can do clinical research as well. Yes, uh, Luigi, if I may add something, we may have some arguments, you know, uh, more and more, I think one of the arguments I discussed already with our younger doctors, 
is that the medicine and the, 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 the job of the physicians will change considerably. If this evolution continue, and I think about uh, artificial intelligence and all the others, a lot of things and a lot that they learn now, they will come into complete routine, which can be completely replaced by the computer in the future. And the thing which will really stay something that for that you will need a real, let's say real doctor who has the knowledge and research and will be innovation. And innovation probably will stay the only thing which computer and artificial intelligence will not take from us. Because you know they are younger, so when they they will in 20, 30 years, we the, the paysage of medicine and the, the way we are going to exercise our job will completely change. So the research gives you this capacity to innovate, to search for new, and this is something which will be completely distinguished from, from artificial intelligence or other system which may come to replace uh, doctors. Maybe, maybe I can add a perspective from a basic scientist. Uh, because you know, when I look here at, the, at this list of, uh, of keywords, um, I think it's probably more experienced researchers. Um, from a perspective of a basic scientist, a young basic scientist, I think one of the key challenges is the question, do I ever be able to come over this hurdle to actually establish myself in this profession. And, and for that, the career path is, um, and I think it's clear, but it's not, a, it's not very um, uh, predictable. So the, the, the point is to, to maintain motivation in, in this, I would say, mature postdoc um, condition where, where, where the people recognize, okay, now it's the time to become this independent um, PI to get into a faculty position. And um, I know that in Europe, in the different countries, there, there are different chances around, but also in Germany, um, we have round about 25 to 28,000 professorships since 1955. And uh, there is a struggle around that. And um, when I talk to my, to my younger, um, you know, not PhD not, but the, 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 the postdocs, they have to make the decision now, do I take the risk at the age of 35 to stay in this crazy project, um, to go along for these additional three, four years, um, to grow older, maybe not being then so attractive anymore for industry. But from a basic science, science perspective, the physicians always have a backup. Um, yeah. They can they can be doctors, but the basic scientist is, uh, you know, if he wants to make an academic career, then it's a digital yes no answer to some to some point. But you know, when when people ask me, what you know, they see like uh, people like Silvio or other researchers who have made you know breakthrough research and uh, they have made a, a wonderful career, then you start telling them you know the journey. And you explain the journey and you explain that uh, it goes with, uh, you know, curiosity, perseverance, uh, and, uh, and then things pay off, in my opinion. But, uh, of course, uh, it's, um, it, it's either you want to for the secure shortcut, and I'm talking about, you know, as a physician, not uh, as a basic scientist, I'm a, I'm a doctor. Uh, or do you want to go with something that uh, you have to pour in uh, many hours of thought, but that is something that comes from you? And, uh, and I think this is something that they need to um, invest more, in my opinion. But well, going you, back, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Dave. If you manage to, 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 to place this thought in their minds that this is probably the best profession on this planet, once, once you have the position that you can actually do whatever you want um, for the next years. And I think that's a fantastic perspective. Um, and um, yeah, I think we, we, we need to serve to some extent as, as role models um, that, that uh, younger people say, yeah, this is great. I can do it. I, I would love to do that. Yeah. Now, the, the other comment that Silvio made, I think is also very important. Uh, uh, doing research costs a lot of money. 
Now, uh, it was like today in uh, some news that I received a petition signed by the main, uh, I mean, many researchers who are funded by uh, the Italian Foundation for Cancer Research, Telethon, uh, because everything is now skyrocketing. I can, you know, and it's not because of COVID, it's not because of, uh, you know, shipping, uh, you know, uh, the, the, um, you know, the, the reagents that you need to do research. It's always been like that. And now with the new technology, it's even more expensive. Uh, so I, I think if we want to, uh, without research, there, there is no advancement. I always tell, you know, a younger students, I go to, uh, to, to uh, high schools so to, to talk about, you know, cancer prevention. And, uh, and then I talk about research and uh, what we do now um, in our day-to-day -day life, how we drive our cars, you know, with the gear shifts that are on the steering wheel. It's all coming from, uh, you know, research that was done in the auto industry. And, uh, you know, we are impacting the future life in many ways. So with, uh, with research, with our research, there is, there is no future. So um, I think government, the governments need really to invest a lot of money. They need to, uh, to provide sustainability. Otherwise, uh, um, this is going to be a big problem in the future. So um, then we can start the next poll. And this is going to uh, actually to address the issue of COVID-19. How did COVID-19 impact your dedicated time as a researcher? Positive, more time to focus on research. Moderate, nothing changed much. Everything changed, but the dedicated time stays the same and negative no time for research. And so before seeing the, you know, the results, we can start with Silvio. Negative because of depression. It's not uh, <laughs> It's true. <laughs> it is true, not among the three potential options. Yeah. But uh, I would say that a lot of people uh, have been, uh, I mean, the people in the lab have been slowed, uh, a lot of different procedures. Uh, uh, this has slowed things down quite a bit. So, but do you think this has changed the, the way your research is done? Do you think, uh, uh, I think is... that now we are more, uh, everybody is very happy about the less travels, more time for ourselves. Uh, the big uh, issue is that before, uh, while I was flying, I was able to prepare myself for a talk. Now it's like a kamikaze. You go to the talk, you, sometimes you, you are not even uh, preparing enough as it was because now you get many things at the same time. Before you were very much more uh, sometimes selective and now you accept maybe more invitations and that's of course uh, some um, uh, talks to pay. But I would say that in general, it's always the same first concept. The passion is driving who does research and that stays. So you try to cope with it. And uh, uh, maybe we are even putting more time on it. What about you, Dirk? Well, I would say moderate to positive, um, which is, I, I, you know, to, to talk about positive things in the... In, the reflection of COVID is, is probably difficult, but the time issue at the beginning was amazing. I remember still uh, April last year, where from one second to the other we were grounded, and I my 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 duties disappeared over over months. <laughs> that was a fascinating experience. I think now it swings back, as Sylvia says, because we are we are we're having now even more tight schedules because um, you, know, you, can, you can have uh, Zoom meetings all day long and uh, um, we don't even have travel breaks in between. Um, that, that's indeed true. But I, what, what I also want to say, which is touching on this in a, in a moderate to negative way, you know, we're working a lot with, with, uh, with mouse models and I realized this is already a very delicate aspect because regulations, and that is probably on top of funding, one of the major threats of research, at least 
the way we do it um, is this enormous overregulated um, um, way we are we are approaching animal research. Not saying that that we need to we need to make sure that we do the proper animal research, but um, the the type of regulation is enormous, and COVID put a lot of pressure on top of this because governmental um, bodies said, you know, if, if somebody in, in your unit would be affected, do you have a backup plan to, to basically take care of, of the animals? And, and in most cases, uh, you had to say, wow, that's, that's the capacity. So they forced you to reduce uh, breeding and to reduce the overall, the overall um, um, kind of um, breeding scenario. So yeah, it slowed down in this aspect quite substantially, the research. Tamara? Yes, I would say that uh, it was valuable. Maybe there were some positive points, but altogether, I would say that it was rather negative. During the lockdown, uh, the lab was closed. Uh, I canceled two fellows from, who were supposed to come from abroad. Uh, and of course, activity was not uh, was not really good. And also, there were some, as, as everywhere, I imagine, different regulations we couldn't gather, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have just said uh, how important it is the social part that the people can discuss face to face, they okay, have brainstorming, etc. So altogether, I think in, on the lab it was not uh, a positive impact for sure. After uh, maybe the whole situation uh, has, has taught us some, we have learned some other modalities of communication of this and that. So maybe it has brought some positive things and we will see the results of that. But altogether, I think that it's, um, it's slowed down. I think the, the in general, the research, I would say. So these are the results from the audience, 33% uh, uh, more time to focus on research and mostly uh, moderate, nothing changed much. I, I can tell you my experience, uh, um, our, my lab uh, was completely shut down for uh, four months and then of course uh, the work could resume very slowly because of social distancing and protocols that were implemented. So what I did actually, I spent uh, a couple of months uh, uh, working on a different project. And I spoke with a, a dear friend that we share with, uh, with Silvio, who's uh, Luigi Laghi, and um, we came up with uh, calculating, you know, the effect of, uh, uh, you know, COVID-19 on, on colon cancer screening uh, in terms of delay of stage, uh, I mean, of upstage of, uh, of the uh, disease because of the delay and uh, the increased mortality. Uh, so I think, um, again, and then we, we, we wrote, uh, you know, reviews. So we started to still, you know, uh, keep our minds uh, working. Um, I wrote a project, so, uh, but it, it's indeed, uh, it, it, you know, a very learning uh, um, situation because of course, uh, as human beings, we can adapt to the situations, but uh, sometimes it's very hard in here to think um, different strategies. So we have some questions from the audience, uh, actually. And uh, one is from Joost Drenth. And he says, uh, maybe we already kind of touched this, but you can, uh, you can add more. We see the basic translational researcher have a very slippery career path and only if you make it to, uh, to the top. This is a waste of talent. Any insights to amend this brain drain? Who wants to go first? Well, maybe I start because that was what I meant with this transition um, where you have to be a bit faithful um, for a good ending. Um, and if you have nothing to fall back on uh, as a basic scientist, for example, it's, it's relatively difficult sometimes to convince people to take this risk. Um, I don't know, in, in Germany, for example, I think there are many structural elements now um, installed with, which help to bridge this gap. And um, we have plenty of, or we have upcoming tenure track professorships, something which um, in Germany uh, did not exist 15 years back. 
uh, allowing young people already being installed as a as a as a early career professor, and then they can tenure and they go to the to the different um, levels of of um, academic progression. So I think um, there are structural elements. Um, I think modern universities implement already, and I think that's uh, very positive. Um, and and at the moment, in Germany at least, um, I would say that the sky is relatively blue, um, yet not all of them see it. Uh, and that, again, brings me back to our role, yeah, to, to, yeah, to foster them and uh, to explain them that the sky could be potentially blue. Silvio, do you want to say something? Really not more than, uh, than what he says, but the issue is that uh, bet on yourself and don't be afraid. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Tamara, do you have any comment on I mean, this? If you start being scared, slippery, and so on, I mean, it's like uh, if you think that that's, and that is uh, going back to the word passion. If you have really passion and you are enjoying what you are doing, do it, and that's it. So, so again, from the from the medical side, it's a little bit complicated. We have just mentioned there are a lot of disturbing factors. They discourage very easily because they can see very easy the career, endoscopic career or other to keep the, the young doctors on the research path. It's, it's, it's even more complicated. But I think, it's, as we said, we have to keep uh, the spirit, the morale. We have to encourage them. Everything is important. And to give a good example, I must say, so we cannot be too tired, too tired and to come completely. They look at us. They look at us. You know, there was very interesting, though many of them start and then they, they stop. So you need to persevere, you need to be motivated. But I think that our, we really have to come back to the old times when you look at our professors and many things are based on example. We have to be a good example to attract them. I think that our role is crucial to show our enthusiasm, to show you know, our determination because we can influence them. And I believe in that. I can see many, many young, they follow if they, you know, if they see you. So this is maybe the way to go. I but if, uh, again, if they see you, uh, of course you put a lot of you know, time, but uh, um, you have the freedom of researching what you like and your passion, you go with your passion. I think that's already, uh, in my opinion, uh, yes. a, 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 a wonderful example of how people yes. can really blossom and develop into a, a researcher career. Uh, well, maybe Mario? Uh, go maybe, ahead, I can make, maybe I can make one point, and I agree in all uh, what, what you said or what we said. Maybe one aspect of our mentorship is also crucial to give um, also feedback when we think it will not lead um, to an mm -hmm. endpoint um, which, which we think is then a, an academic career. So we should be mentors in in the positive, motivating way, but also in the very honest way um, and, and creating an environment where they trust us that we have the experience to at least estimate their path. Yeah. Um, you know, we can never be sure, but they need to trust us that they have the potential. And that means we also need to be honest um, about yeah. potential. You are perfectly right, but this is very delicate. In Absolutely. my experience, I could see the reveal of people so late and so different, you know, things that we could say, well, it will never be. And finally, he just finally. Yeah, yeah. You know, so we have to be very careful of that. But you, you're right. We have to be honest, but to be very careful not to, you know, discourage too early. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I think we have time for probably one or two questions. How could we reduce the gender gap in research? <laughs> we have Tamara within us and uh, do you have any thought about this? Well, I think that whenever you look around, I think it's done. We are doing it already. 
Look at UEG. I remember, Luigi, I don't know whether you were a meeting of members of UEG a couple of years ago. It was John Atherton who was, you know, crying. Oh, look at this. And I say, John, don't worry, it will come slowly. Just don't put too much obstacles and we will arrive. You will know. And you can see now, now it's half and half. So it is coming. I think it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's quite a natural evolution, just, uh, you know, not to, I don't, uh, my, my opinion was always, I was always, you know, asked to participate in many different, you know, manifestations and something I always refused, because there is something that women do not want, never, to say that, ah, he, she has got it because she is a woman. So, you know, it's, but it, it's coming already. So we can see it. And uh, if there are some female colleagues listening to, to us, uh, the only, uh, the only uh, uh, I would say advice I could give, and this is really my opinion, that um, the career is a question of family. And it's not some institutional decision that will say, well, we will help you to make a career, but it's a family discussion that uh, your, your close uh, people you live with, we say, okay, I will help because if, you're, if your child is sick and is crying the whole night, then no matter what the, the institutional you know, rights you have, you will not write the paper after that because you will be tired. So it's really a kind of family and personal decision. I want to go on this track and I have a backup from my family. I think this is the first thing. So very, very quick replies if you have, uh, dear Orsivio. Well, from, from my point of view, I have, uh, as I said, I have uh, uh, a lot of female scientists uh, in my lab. Uh, also, um, more mature career level. And from my experience, what helps enormously if, uh, if I give them flexibility um, and, and I can give them flexibility in a certain frame. I can unfortunately not give them flexibility if they have to bring their kids to daycare and that's closed for COVID reasons. That's the end of it then, but the day-to-day the, the -day organization in the lab to give them max flexibility and, and supporting them by saying, arrange your, arrange your workload and, and day organization according to your needs. Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, I agree. Nothing more really. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, a few takeaways from uh, this uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, I think, um, you know, research career is not easy, especially for basic and translational science. Uh, but of course, uh, if you are a researcher, you are motivated by your curiosity, your passion. And uh, as we, we discussed, there are possibilities of blossoming and flourishing and becoming leaders in their respective fields. Mm. One thing that is important and probably we didn't discuss about this is mentorship. I think this is something that is very important. You need to find uh, the right mentor. If you find the right mentor, as um, we were discussing, uh, I think also you will have uh, a, you know, uh, you, you can make a choice. You can decide whether you want to pursue the career because uh, of course you will be seeing, you will be living in an, in an environment that is uh, really helpful and sustaining. Uh, your career. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for being with us today. Uh, I think we need to uh, have more of these discussions in the future. With uh, UEG, we are trying really to uh, boost research, uh, not only from the top down, going with the, uh, um, you know, increased funding for, uh, for uh, European projects in, uh, in GI, but also we want to have this bottom up uh, approach in which we are fostering young researchers uh, uh, and I think this is very important to have uh, you know successful stories like yours uh, um, for the young researchers so that they have you know a, a picture and uh, they they can frame you know they can see themselves in uh, following the same path as you are as you have done so thank you very much again yeah,